Good morning, everyone, or I should say some good afternoon. Um, my name is Marat Fine. I'm the Program Manager for Member Services at the Jewish Funders Network in New York. And I'm really excited um, to bring to you today a terrific presentation about early childhood education out of Chicago. Um, as you know, a word about JFN. As you know, our mission is to help funders to maximize their impact and to use the power of networks to leverage creativity and to create change in the Jewish world. Each of our programs is based in a Jewish value, um, which you can find on our website if you go take a look. This one in particular I think is really about partnership, that we don't advocate for a particular funding cause, but we're really all about bringing people together to support great work. Uh, and that's what we hope to do through this webinar and through all of our programming. Um, a moment uh, about our two terrific presenters. We have with us Debbie Cooper, the Associate Vice President for Community Outreach and Engagement at the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago. She oversees young family engagement, connecting thousands of families, and she also oversaw the implementation of the PJ Library in Chicago, growing it to the largest program in North America. We have also with us Anna Hartman, the Director of Early Childhood Excellence at the Jewish United Fund in Chicago. And she cultivates the communal resources and brings together educators and leaders to focus on the strategy for early childhood education uh, in Chicago uh, for Jewish schools, of course. So I'm really excited to learn with and from all of you folks today. Just a quick reminder, if you're calling in, just go ahead and mute yourself. Um, so that there is no feedback, and you can unmute when you're ready to ask questions at the end. If you do want to ask questions, you can feel free to chat them to me, email them to me. My email is open, or at the end, uh, we'll take questions, and uh, you can just go ahead and ask them. So without further ado, uh, Debbie Cooper. Great. Thank you so much, Mayrov. Um, we are really excited to be here today and really grateful for the opportunity. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background before we sort of jump into the presentation, just to tell you sort of where we are and where we sit, JUF is the um, Jewish United Fund, is the name for the Chicago Federation. We have been around for over 100 years and raise about approximately $84 million annually to support human services, create Jewish experiences, and support community connections. We do this locally and around the world. Our Jewish community has about 290,000 Jews. We cover a six-county area, and we are a pretty disparate Jewish, Jewish community with over 300 um, discrete zip codes. Sorry, did you want to say something? Okay, I thought I heard something on the feedback on the phone. Okay, so Anna and I are part of JUF, and we actually work um, very closely together, but formally sit in two different departments. So the department that I represent is called Community Outreach and Engagement, and the work of this department is to make Jewish life in Chicago more accessible, engaging, relevant, and meaningful for the populations with whom we work. And um, Anna Hartman is the Director of Early Childhood Excellence, and she actually works out of our Community Foundation for Jewish Education, which is now also a part of JUF, um, much like what is happening in a number of communities um, around the country, we used to have a separate board of Jewish education, and that has about two and a half years ago came in-house and is now more directly tied to and closely a part of JUF. Um, and its mission is to advance imaginative, compelling, collaborative, and experiential Jewish education. So um, we're going to jump into um, our presentation, and today we're focusing specifically on young families and engaging them in Jewish life through a number of our key programs and thinking about how our two departments or two parts of the organization really work together to provide um, a seamless experience for families and work toward this collective impact that we're um, hoping to have some um, uh, impact on. Okay, so we believe there are about 17,000 families with young children in Chicago, and this is about children probably five or six and under. And um, our goal in this is to help these families find meaningful connections to Judaism and Jewish life. Um, the way our department does this is sort of we have a four-pronged strategy. We are looking to identify Jews that are marginally or not very connected to the Jewish community. We help to build social networks, um, which will eventually lead to future Jewish decision-making based on a lot of research by Cohen and others. 
Um, we are looking to connect families to Jewish institutions and programming through information sharing and through providing incentives, and that's sort of one of the main programs we're going to talk about today is how we do that. And then finally, um, because we're situated at the Federation, one of our primary goals is to strengthen the capacity of all of our partners, our Jewish organizational partners, such as preschools and JCCs and synagogues, to better serve families with young children. Okay, so um, we're going to sort of jump into this call really um, originated from an interest in learning about the JUF Right Start program, which has been around for about eight years. Um, and I want to take a step back to sort of talk about how this program originated and where, you know, it started and how it sort of evolved into the program that it is today. So um, a little bit over 10 years ago, a group of mega philanthropists met in New York to talk about sort of what the next big idea was going to be sort of to hit the Jewish landscape. Um, birthright you know, had been created. People were very excited about what was coming out of it. And they wanted to know, you know, what's the next big thing and the big area that we could impact? So the idea they came up with was a program to encourage families to consider Jewish um, early childhood programs. And this program was actually referred to as Baby Birthright for quite a while. Um, after they went through sort of looking at what the market would be and how much money it would take, the collaborative funding model fell apart for it. But two communities who were around the table at the time and were involved we're very excited about this idea and about sort of um, moving something forward, either you know, called Baby Birthright. At one point, it was called the Newborn Gift Initiative. Um, and so two communities, Chicago and Western Massachusetts, um, sort of worked together to develop this program around um, looking at how can we make a difference in terms of encouraging families and more families to choose a Jewish early childhood program. So in thinking about sort of, you know, when I was talking to um, one of these executives who was really instrumental in um, developing the program and moving it forward, he talks about it, um, and the rationale he talks about is it's an opportunity to connect with families very early in their journey. Um, we know that um, the more engaged families, more families that are engaged with early childhood leads to more Jewish decision making later in life, later on their family sort of journey. So the more people we can get in, it serves as a great feeder to other programs. We know that Jewish early childhood programs are high quality. Um, it is the strongest, most immersive way of fostering Jewish identity and development in children and in families. And it also creates those great friendship groups that young parents um, create when their kids are younger that tend to persist over time. And we know that those social networks are critical for future Jewish decision making. Um, another part of this program, and this is something we've seen with PJ Library, is that this whole idea of building on what's normative. So sending your child to a Jewish early, or sending your child to an early childhood center, either for school or for care, is something that families are doing anyway. Um, and so the idea of this is that we're taking a behavior that's normative and then encouraging them um, to choose a Jewish path for that. So we don't need to actually create demands for the behavior. We just need to steer in a direction. Um, and finally, um, one of the great uh, pieces of this program, called right, which will, you know, will be revealed next slide to be called Right Start, is um, it really demonstrates the communal importance of Jew Jewish early childhood. And what we've sort of seen time and time again is that a lot of families, particularly if they're not from the Chicago area and come from other communities, sort of can't believe that we have this program that essentially pays families to attend a Jewish early childhood program. And I think it says a lot um, to both those families and to the schools about how important we think this work is and how important this decision is in families. Okay. So now we're going to go into the program itself. And um, oops, these were the wonderful slides that sort of talk about the points um, that we talked about. So you have families sort of um, elucidating on how this experience is really impactful for them. Um, and I'll give you just a moment to sort of look at these um, quotes from parents before we move on. Okay, great. So now we're going to jump into the mechanics of the Right Start program. And um, this was a name that we gave to the program right away. I should mention that there are um, four other programs 
and other communities now, and they all sort of use the word Right Start, but they call it something a little bit different depending on what the name of their sponsoring organization is. Generally, it's a federation. So um, the one in Palm Beach, for example, is called Jewish Right Start of the Palm Beaches. And so there is some sort of flexibility with the name, but they all sort of um, relate to this concept of Right Start. So um, the goal of the Right Start program is to substantially underwrite the first year's tuition, encouraging more families to consider and ultimately choose a Jewish early childhood program. So this program is available um, from beginning when a child is six weeks, which is when you know, the earliest a program would take them, up until sort of the pre-K or JK or four-year-old year. It's different in different parts of the country what that's called. But the idea is you want to make this program as expansive as possible, but still staying within sort of the early childhood realm. realm. So we don't, um, people who are, are not eligible for this program entering the kindergarten year. It's really for children zero to four. And the other thing I would say about this program is um, we serve, we, uh, the schools that participate represent sort of the broad spectrum of Jewish life. They are housed in synagogues of all different denominations. Um, JCC, some are independent, a Hebrew immersion school. So this is not sort of a stamp on saying, you know, these are the schools that we think are best or they think are right. It's looking at the schools in our community that are accredited Jewishly and then helping families find their ways to them in um, recognizing that families are different and diverse and different schools meet families' different needs. So the mechanics of how this program works is a family would apply to a school at that time, the school would let them know about the early, um, about the Right Start program. And I should mention that we also do a lot of advertising, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of the kind of things that we do to make families aware of this program. But as a family is applying to school, they would also apply to the JOF Right Start program. They would be eligible for up to $2,000. And the way it works is if a child is planning to attend four to five days a week, they would be eligible for a $2,000 voucher. If they're attending two to three days a week, they'd be eligible for a $1,000 voucher. And I'll talk about the sibling part in a moment because it's new. And the idea with both these, the $2,000 voucher and the $1,000 voucher is that it's the first time that the family has enrolled in a Jewish early childhood center. So the idea was that when families are at this first decision point in terms of schooling for their children, that we would make um, an incentive, a financial incentive, to encourage them to go in that direction. The feedback over the number of years this program has run is, what about my second child? What about my third child? And so in the past, while we sort of assumed that, hey, once you choose a school, you're likely to send subsequent children to that school, sometimes that's true. But oftentimes, um, things have changed over the time that a first and second and subsequent children have gone to school. Families may have moved. Um, working circumstances may have changed. Maybe now both parents are working. Maybe only one parent's working, and something has changed between the second and third, you know, the first and the second, or the second and third child. And so families are sort of at this decision point once again. And we don't just assume that just because they sent one child to an early childhood program that that's the path they will follow for the rest of their families. So new this year, and because we had some, we uh, acquired some additional funding to do so, we offered what's called a sibling voucher. So while the original voucher program was only for the first child in a family to attend a Jewish school, the sibling voucher allows $500 for any subsequent child to attend a Jewish uh, preschool, the first, and for us to reimburse tuition the first time they are enrolled in the program. So before I go on, and Marav, you can tell me if this is not okay, but I just wanted to open it to any questions about the mechanics of the program. It's always okay. the task question. No worries. Sure. Okay, so I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to keep um, I'm going to keep on going. But the mechanics can be a little bit tricky, and as people think about sort of whether this is a program or not, they're thinking about implementing in their communities. Lots of things come up, and please know that we are always available to um, answer questions. We work really closely with the four other communities that are running this program, and we learn from each other about different ways to make it work. So now I'm going to continue and go on to um, the impact of our program. Because of course, you know, what's the first thing that you know somebody asks when we talk about this program is, well, aren't you paying families that would have you know chosen to go anyway? And any time you have an entitlement program, meaning that you don't have to um, document you know financial need or other need for this program, of course you're going to be paying for families that would have chosen this anyway. Much like might you have sent a child to Israel on birthright who would have gotten to Israel anyway, perhaps. 
but we look every single year to make sure that the benefit of the program is actually something that we're able to stand behind. So in our last survey of families who finished school in, in May of 2016, 67% of the families who responded to us indicated that the voucher was influential in their decision to attend a Jewish preschool. And we had about a 25% response rate. 15% of the families indicated that if not for the voucher, they would have enrolled in a less expensive or a secular early childhood program or not enrolled in any uh, early childhood program. So we know from our colleagues around the country that many are seeing a decline in Jewish preschool enrollment of about 10 to 20 percent each year. So if you look at that, we have 15 percent of our families who are saying, hey, if it wasn't for this voucher, we might have gone somewhere. We would have, we would have gone somewhere else. We would have been enrolled um, in a secular program, or we would have um, just kept our child out of early childhood at all this year. We attribute this program to really helping to keep our numbers stable and over time perhaps even grow a little bit um, as we make other changes to our school. Okay. And um, one of the important points when we were sort of thinking about this call and um, thinking about, you know, what makes the Right Start program so impactful? Part of, the reason, part of that is it does not exist in a vacuum and it is not sort of a standalone program. It is part of this sort of path of engagement and um, comprehensive community approach to how we think about engaging families with young children and strengthening the experiences that they're going to have from us, uh, have with us. So part of it is, and you see sort of this like, pregnant belly, I don't know if you can read the sticker on it, but it says, I'm a Chicago J-Baby. J-Baby Chicago is a newish program, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth on the next slide, that engages parents of zero to two-year-olds in Jewish life. This program started two years ago, and already we've been in touch with 1,400 families in the zero, who have children in the zero to two range um, who are engaging with us many, many times a week through our J-Baby programs. And so they become this very strong feeder system to the Jewish early childhood centers. So if we didn't have an audience to connect with and let them know about the schools, um, Right Start would be effective for those who are already sort of looking anyway and found their way into the schools. But it's because we have this audience of families who are not necessarily thinking Jewish. Um, and we know that about two thirds of our families are not um, considering or not ending up in Jewish schools that we have this built-in audience to help serve as a feeder that we can really talk to about the Right Start program, and it gives us a platform on which to talk about the value of Jewish early childhood programs. And then we, we, the next slide, so the next little picture shows you play groups and sort of the different ways that we engage with families leading to Right Start, so it gives us an opportunity to talk about Right Start. And then the other end, you, and this is sort of what Anna is going to talk about in, in a few moments, is if we weren't feeding people into a product that we felt was really solid and high quality and yielded meaningful outcomes for its participants, um, then there's no reason to sort of incent money and spend money in encouraging families to choose it. So the other piece of this puzzle is making sure that the places to which we're sending them are as impactful and as high quality as they can be. And finally, I was just going to talk for a moment um, about J Baby Chicago because that is our newest program and that has really significantly um, contributed to a much wider audience of people that we're talking with. Just to give an example, when Right Start started eight years ago, we had 250 families that were giving, we were giving vouchers to. This year, we are at already 875 families. So the, and part of it too, I will say, is because we added the sibling program, but that only counts for about 200 or so. It is really because we have um, widened the audience to whom we are talking that we have such a significant increase in the number of families that we're now um, reaching with this program. So JBaby is a new parent engagement program. It's geared to families age um, zero to two. Sort of the key um, engine of this program is our 10 parent ambassadors who are employed by um, JUF, and they are paid to go out and meet with new parents when they first have a baby and talk to them and sort of really start with where they are, hear from them how everything is going, make connections, and then help to figure out where they can plug into people depending on what their needs are, if it's friendships, 
if they're looking for synagogue life, if they're looking for childcare or a school. Um, it's these one-on-one -on -one authentic relationships that are, and talking about programs like Right Start, which are really helping to move families along the pipeline. And then it really builds those connections to our next step. So rather than just families seeing something in an email from us or real, us waiting for them to sort of respond to something that we're doing, it's very tailor-made to families. So we know what their interests are. It's something that we catalog and track. And so if we know a family is thinking about um, sending their child to um, a program when they turn um, one, we have that information and can push it out to families at the right time. Um, Another way that we've done this, um, we did it for the second time this year, we started last year, is by holding a Preschool 101 um, workshop. We started it with it in the city last year, and this year we're going to do two workshops, one in the city and one with our suburban schools. And that's essentially an opportunity to literally marry these two worlds. It's advertising to all of our day baby families to uh, come into a space and a really like beautiful space and have some have a fun night out and also hear from a bunch of um, our preschool um, and early childhood center directors about their programs, uh, first on a panel, and then they have an opportunity to talk with them around small round table and have some great discussions with them about it. At that meeting, we also have um, Anna Hartman and her colleagues who are able to sit down and really talk with families about um, sort of what, what they're thinking about, answer their questions about when the right age might be to send their children. So again, it's really focusing on these um, personal connections and helping families take those next steps. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Anna, who is going to talk to you um, what happens when they get to those next steps. Okay, this is Anna, as we switch the microphone. Um, and my position, um, again, at the Federation is, is called the Director of Early Childhood Excellence. Um, I have been, this is a new position as of the last 15 months or so. Um, and to give you a sense of the kinds of things that I work on, um, you see on this slide, I really am focused on how to maximize the potential of Jewish preschool. And again, preschool we use as a, as a category, but we really mean um, beginning with infants. Um, all the way up until age five or six. Um, so three big areas, I would say, uh, that, that I am thinking about all the time. Um, the first is assessment, meaning where are we? Uh, wh what is the state of our system? Uh, what is the state of our schools? The second focus is really nurturing quality, again, to really maximize the potential of what's happening in these places. And then finally, looking out to what's on the horizon. Um, and looking for barriers that are ahead and how we can work as a collective uh, to address some of these barriers. And I want to say that in, t in sharing some pieces with you here, um, we really thought about offering you a sample of the kinds of programs um, that, that we have been um, utilizing, um, things that are the components that make up a larger system um, and that are linked together, and also some programs really that you could look at um, as distinct elements that could be funded. That is to say, if you're in a smaller community, you may not be able to do all of these different things. If you're in a larger community, you could do more. Um, and some of these are standalone areas um, where a funder could look at a community and say, let me see if I can jump in and help um, with this one area. And because it's a system, you could really grow from any, um, any one of these areas. So looking first at assessment, <clears throat> where we are, where we're going, and how we would get there. Um, so I first want to talk about a study that uh, Debbie began and my department jumped in to help with, um, which was a preschool choice study. Um, Boston has conducted one of these as well, um, but we conducted this over the last um, year and a half. Um, we surveyed families really coming um, from J-Baby and from PJ Library. Um, over 1,000 families participated in a study that would help us look at how do families make preschool decisions. What are they choosing and how are they choosing them and what are they saying about our schools? Um, and some of the ideas that came out of this um, really were we had a sense that there are barriers to entry that seem insurmountable, um, such as location, cost, and as well there are some minor areas that are minor areas of concern. Maybe uh, I think 12% of our population had concerns about security, just as an example. The thing is that we felt that with dollars and resources we could fix, because it didn't seem so large. Um, and then we had some perception and awareness issues. 
Um, did people know about um, the Right Start voucher? Did people know that there was a Jewish preschool in their area? Um, how did they perceive um, maybe the academics um, in a certain preschool? Um, and overall, uh, we were, uh, we felt good to see that the reputation of our schools was strong. Um, I think that's a question that we had going in. Do people think that Jewish preschools are something that they want to buy into? And we felt overwhelmingly that that was a very positive message we got, was keep on going, just focus on some of these areas. Um, as well, we undertook a lot of site visits. So I work myself with a, uh, we've recently hired a director of early childhood professional learning. Um, and the two of us um, spend a lot of time visiting schools. So in my first year, really getting to visit the 39 Jewish preschools that we have across Chicagoland to really get a sense of where quality was, where are the gaps in quality, and to get a sense of the strength. Um, and this is important because knowing what you have, of course we know why it's important, but knowing what we have allowed us to figure out what would be good strategies for moving forward. Um, and that became a key in some of our planning going ahead. Um, on the data side, we've been collecting through the JUF Right Start voucher program much data, but we also engaged with JData over the last um, few years to, to really collect more data from our centers. So I'll share with you a little bit about uh, the demographics of our centers. And I'll also say that um, this was, we really want to be making obviously more informed decisions based on data. And um, you know, bringing in uh, JData as a partner to take on a lot of this data collection has been really positive. And as well, uh, we incentivize schools. This is really part of the key to our success. Um, we do not give any direct dollars to schools, typically as part of any kind of um, uh, initiative, but we, we paid schools $500 each to take the time to do this data collection. And I want to say that because it's important and it helps uh, to make this possible. So we have 39 Jewish Early Childhood Centers. As Debbie mentioned, these are diverse in terms of religious affiliation, um, and also they're all around different parts of Chicago spread out. Um, we have synagogue schools, community center schools, day schools with their early childhood department, um, and uh, one independent school as well. The schools are of varied sizes. Schools that, the smallest school has 19 children enrolled, and the largest school has 218. Also, when you look at the data side by side, it's very affecting to see um, if you have large schools or small schools. It starts to give you a sense of how the business model is working um, and how we can think about that going forward. Um, we have over 3,000 children enrolled in, in our early childhood programs, again, ranging from infants through age six. Um, and then um, I would like to talk a little bit about strategic planning, which is that we coming from these basic assessments that we undertook in person and through surveying families and data collection, we started to see how we might put all these together towards some larger initiatives um, to help our schools grow. Um, and then we, we have contracted out with Third Plateau, um, a, a social media, excuse me, a social impact um, strategy firm um, in the Bay Area to help us uh, just to give us some really smart people to help organize a process of strategic planning for our, our community um, that helps us really collate all that we have collected and think about how to move it forward while really building some buy-in from the community. So as we look to infuse greater quality into our programs, um, I'll just mention a few areas. The first is I mentioned my colleague Jenna who works with us, Jenna Turner, on um, professional learning. Um, so Jenna and I make ourselves available for regular conversations, meetings, coffees, lunches with early childhood directors, um, and with people looking to move into the field, um, constantly available to help put on professional development at no charge, um, to meet with faculty in small groups. Uh, my colleague Jenna is, is meeting with a school in January to help them redesign their art uh, space, um, spending the day with them over winter break. Um, so really being available to help teachers and directors navigate through all the wonderful opportunities and, and move ahead. Um, this year we instituted, we really wanted to, our teachers to be able to see what is possible um, in early childhood and to get out of Chicago um, to imagine greater things. We had heard a lot from colleagues, uh, especially a colleague of ours in Washington, D.C., um, that study travel um, and traveling together really helps develop a community and a network uh, among the education leaders. 
Um, so we took one group of educators, uh, uh, we opened up to the community that people could study and travel with us either to Los Angeles um, or for schools that have really um, invested in a big way in studying progressive educational practices, specifically those that came out of Reggio Emilia, Italy, taking hold of uh, the education world, that we would offer to do an intensive study program meeting monthly and then traveling on a study tour to Reggio Emilia in the spring. Um, so this enabled us to take teams from each school of one school leader and two teachers. Um, we are taking six schools to Los Angeles with 18 educators, six additional schools, are studying with us with their 18 educators um, to go to Reggio Emilia, um, Italy in the spring. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about grants. So let me take one step back to say, when we're talking about nurturing quality, we knew that we would need to be investing in people. Um, and one of the threads that you'll see here is we understand we will need to really invest in the faculty members. We felt that in early childhood across the country, there's been some good focus in nurturing um, future leaders, but we really felt that we have to double down on our workforce. Um, that seems to be uh, an area that we want to focus on. So um, these were some rare opportunities, not just for education leaders, but also for teachers as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about grants. Um, we have been offering best practices grants. Um, I, I sometimes will joke that in the absence of staff people to do the work, um, if, you have, if you have this kind of carrot available, a lot can get done. And what I, we offered um, grants to schools last year, if they completed their JData, uh, their census work, then they were eligible to apply for a grant of up to $20,000 um, every school. And um, teachers and directors told us that no one's ever asked them before, how would they like to grow as a school, and been willing to put dollars toward that. So some of the things that we heard from people we said you can apply for a grant to double down on something that you have already been doing that is a best practice, um, but that you need further funding to grow it um, and to scale it. So we, um, we have funded child development specialists um, to move to additional sites um, within certain school systems. Um, we've uh, funded a school to expand its loose parts curriculum. That's a progressive approach to using materials with young children. Um, schools that wanted to study particular educational approaches and wanted workshops for their faculties we funded. Um, we have one school that got a, a grant for $20,000 um, to, to spend time documenting the, the, the development of Jewish identity in their schools. And with the funds, they are also writing a book um, that really will be a workbook that Chicago and national educators can utilize for reflecting on the development of Jewish identity with young children in the classroom. Um, we, another school wanted to focus more on bringing in more nonfiction books to their library. This is an area that was really lacking for them. And finally, um, we funded for one school system that has four sites um, study travel uh, for, their, for their emerging leaders. Um, this is a school that's really in a position that will be turning over a lot of its senior leadership um, and needs to focus on, on that as well. Um, all of these individuals will present at the end of the year, and we have a, a convening at the end of the year, and they will present on all of these projects that they've worked on. So we said from the beginning that priority would go to schools that are collaborative, and this is starting to build a culture of what's mine is ours. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes. Um, we also instituted an awards program, a family um, in our community uh, had a mother who had been a long-time early childhood teacher, and they um, donated funds so that we could award every year the Stupinski Award for Excellence in Jewish Education. Um, many of you may do these kinds of award programs already. Uh, the educator receives a $5,000 cash prize. It's been a great way to mobilize lay people on our committee, spotting excellence around the community. Um, and each of the, each of the uh, winners, to be eligible, you have to have been a teacher for five years or more. Um, in the system. And then finally, I just want to take a look at how we've been addressing some barriers on the horizon. And um, looking at who's on the call, um, I, I think we've been in meetings with at least one of you before to, to look at how communities could work together um, to, to look at some of these barriers, because they certainly are not ours alone. Um, uh, here I want to circle back to the workforce. Um, we're looking ahead. You know, we've all said in early childhood, there's a great study from the 90s that suggested that we are currently in a five-year period in which 
70% of early childhood leaders would be reaching retirement age. And like many of you, we are seeing that in a big way, but also we are noticing with our teachers. Um, young women and men are not really being told that this is a high quality uh, career to have. It's not for the smartest among us, and we, we really, we know that that's not true. This is a meaningful way to work, and it, we have been thinking about all the ways to move this forward. So we are working on an initiative um, that really is a hybrid, I would say, between Teach for America um, and a lab school program. We in Chicago have several schools that really are doing great work, uh, and we'll be onboarding 12 new fellows. God willing, this should happen. We will onboard 12 new fellows, um, recent college graduates who may not have considered this as a career, and we will help onboard them um, into our field. This will also enable us to pilot new ways of onboarding um, so that we have some ways to, to orient new teachers over time. This will also enable us to provide stipends for 12 mentor teachers around the field. So where we might be concerned about retaining teachers um, who have developed expertise, this gives us a way to give them a leadership position. Um, and it also allows us to find ways to invest in our vanguard schools um, so that we're helping schools in wh wherever they are on the quality continuum to advance. Um, next, I want to talk about Barrier Buster Grants. Um, this has been a really exciting initiative in the last year. We have uh, received a grant to be able to offer $100,000 in grants to schools. The schools could apply for up to $20,000. Again, they needed to have completed their JData census report. Um, and they were asked to look at barriers that came out of our preschool choice study. Um, those barriers could include location, cost, um, security, marketing, uh, and any of those areas and say how they would, if they had some dollars, how would they uh, fix and address these, these barriers. Um, so we gave out $100,000 in grants. They ranged from $3,000 to $20,000. Um, schools did, conducted feasibility studies for adding or changing their hours, because hours is a major barrier for families, as we know. Um, schools are investigating if they can, what it would take to change their licensing and um, be able to add hours for families. We have schools who are investigating partnerships with at-home daycares um, as a way of offering infant care to their families. Um, as far as we know, that's something that's never really been looked at in our field in, in Jewish early childhood education. We have our JCCs here are doing a really large interfaith outreach study, studying best practices on really making families feel at home in our schools. Um, we, this is another barrier that came out of the study, that this was an uh, interfaith um, children uh, from interfaith homes really are getting the chance, are they really getting the chance to come into our schools? Are they feeling as welcomed as everyone else? So we're excited to learn from this process at the JCC. We also gave a grant to a school to renovate a shared space that they use for play groups because we did hear in our study that the, uh, the aging facilities that we work with can be a barrier to some people. Um, we offered grants toward professional development programs to um, update the curricula so that they were really the most cutting edge. We did hear from families that in some cases um, there was a question as to the kindergarten readiness coming out of some of our schools, so this is a way to address that. Another school just uh, created a beautiful recruitment video using these funds, and another school has updated marketing materials and hired a marketing consultant as well. Um, I want to mention here, um, I'm going to go out of order for a minute here and mention these national partners. Um, before my position was in place, uh, we were really fortunate in Chicago to have some great national partners to undertake some work here. And I want to say it out loud because to say, depending on where you are, you may find this to be a great opportunity to have, bring some expertise to your community. Um, so the Jewish Theological Seminary and Hebrew Union College have a program called JESLI that works on leadership development. And they've come here and they're working with 18 emerging leaders in our field and engaging them in deep thinking about curriculum and leadership. Um, as well, the Union for Reform Judaism runs a program here with its own acronym called SEALI, which is the Chicago Early Engagement Leadership Initiative. Um, and that's been a great way to convene schools, um, a cohort of schools, 12 schools, that meet with their lay people as well to tackle some strategic challenges that the schools are having. Um, so I want to say that that's been a great way to, to work as well. Um, sometimes we don't have the bandwidth to do all of these, and certainly when these programs came to town, we did not. And it's been a pleasure to be able to spread the work out and have other professionals coming into our community. Um, and then finally, um, I want to say that this community planning work is ongoing. 
um, coming out of the strategic planning process that we're in now. Um, we're really talking about where are we headed, um, how do we want to stage initiatives in our community. Uh, right now, sometimes it can feel like there's so many blessings out there. Uh, sometimes I feel that we're throwing a, a several life preservers out to schools that are having trouble swimming. Um, and uh, some of our schools are swimming better, and that's not what they need anymore. And some of our schools are, saying, are feeling like they can't grab all of the life preservers. So how can we get to a place where we really have a collective um, that's working together? And how might we together develop some kind of mechanism for communal decision making and communal convening? And with that, Debbie, did you want to add anything before we take questions? No, I think I'll open it to questions. Hi, everyone. This is Marav. I don't have a question. I uh, just wanted to say quickly thank you to both Debbie and Anna for teaching us so much about the importance of investing early in Jewish education for children and, and telling us about all of the programming that you guys are providing and developing. It's terrific and so exciting to see so much progress and such change. Um, and to offer again, if anybody has questions, to please ask them now. Okay. So I guess um, unless either Debbie or Anna have anything to add, um, we can close. You guys good? Yes, and we want to say thank you to all of you, and we would love to hear from any of you um, to talk through any uh, and partner possibly into the future. I'm looking at someone. Um, is it is it Wendy, um, who we've partnered with before? But local communities, we love that. Terrific. So um, this recording will be sent around along with a survey. Um, I can also include Anna and Debbie's contact information. And uh, feel free to reach out to either of them or to me if you'd like to talk about partnerships, about um, more about this topic. Uh, JFN is, is really excited to have you guys um, speaking about it and teaching us about it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a happy holiday season, everybody, and a happy new year. Take care. Bye-bye.